Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, Chapter 8. I'll put the links below to the playlist of the other videos. Hoping to duck another lecture, I got up early and set out before Dad was awake. I slipped a note under his door and went to grab Emma's apple, but it wasn't on my nightstand where I'd left it. A thorough search of the floor uncovered a lot of dust bunnies and one leathery thing the size of a golf ball. I was starting to wonder if someone had swiped it when I realised that the leathery thing was the apple. At some point during the night, it had gone profoundly bad, spoiling like I've never seen fruit spoil. It looked as though it had spent a year locked in a food dehydrator. When I tried to pick it up, it crumbled in my hand like a clump of soil. Puzzled, I shrugged it off and went out. It was pissing rain, but I soon left grey skies behind for the reliable sun of the loop. This time, however, there were no pretty girls waiting for me on the other side of the con, or anyone for that matter. I tried not to be too disappointed, but I was, a little. As soon as I got to the house, I started looking for Emma, but Miss Peregrine intercepted me before I'd even made it past the front door. A word, Mr Portman, she said, and led me into the privacy of the kitchen, still fragrant from the rich breakfast I'd missed. I felt like I'd be summoned to the principal's office. Miss Peregrine propped herself against the giant cooking range. Are you enjoying your time with us? she said. I told her I was, very much. That's good, she replied, and then her smile vanished. I understand you had a pleasant afternoon with some of my wards yesterday, and a lively discussion as well. It was great. They're all really nice. I was trying to keep things light, but I could tell she was winding me up for something. Tell me, she said. How would you describe the nature of your discussion? I tried to remember. I don't know. We talked about lots of things. How things are, how they are, where I'm from, where you're from. Right. And do you think it's wise to discuss events in the future with children from the past? Children? Is that really how you think of them? I regretted saying this even as the words were passing my lips. It is how they regard themselves as well, she said testily. What would you call them? Given her mood, it wasn't subtlety I was prepared to argue. Children, I guess. Indeed. Now, as I was saying, she said, emphasising her words with little clever chops of her hand on the range, do you think it's wise to discuss the future with children from the past? I decided to go out on a limb. No? Ah, but apparently you do. I know this because last night at dinner we were treated by Hugh to a fascinating disquisition on the wonders of 21st century telecommunications technology. Her voice dripped with sarcasm. Did you know that when you send a letter in the 21st century, it can be received almost instantaneously? I think you're talking about email. Well, Hugh knew all about it. I don't understand, I said. Is that a problem? She unleaned herself from the range and took a limping step toward me. Even though she was a full foot shorter than I was, she still managed to be intimidating. As an imbreen, it is my sworn duty to keep those children safe, and above all, that means keeping them here, in the loop, on this island. Okay. Yours is a world they can never be a part of, Mr Portman. So what's the use in filling their heads with grand talk about the exotic wonders of the future? Now you've got half the children begging for a jet airplane trip to America, and the other half dreaming of the day when they can own a telephone computer like yours. I'm sorry, I didn't realise. This is their home. I've tried to make it as fine a place as I could, but the plain fact is they cannot leave and I'd appreciate it if you didn't make them want to. But why can't they? She narrowed her eyes at me for a moment, and then shook her head. Forgive me, I continue to underestimate the breadth of your ignorance. Miss Peregrine, who seemed to be constitutionally incapable of idleness, took a saucepan from the stovetop and began scouring it with a steel brush. I wondered if she was ignoring my question or simply weighing how best to dumb down the answer. When the pan was clean, she clapped it back on the stove and said, They cannot linger in your world, Mr Portman, because in a short time they would grow old and die. What do you mean, die? 
I'm not certain how I it can be more direct. They'll die, Jacob. She spoke tersely, as if wishing to put the topic behind us as quickly as possible. It may appear to you that we've found a way to cheat death, but it's an illusion. If the children loiter too long on your side of the loop, all the many years from which they have abstained will descend upon them at once in a matter of hours. I pictured a person shriveling up and crumbling to dust like the apple on my nightstand. That's awful, I said with a shudder. <clears throat> the few instance of, instances of it that I've had the mischief fortune to witness are among the worst memories of my life. And let me assure you, I've lived long enough to see some truly dreadful things. Then it's happened before. To a young girl under my own care, regrettably, a number of years ago, her name was Charlotte. It was the first and last time I ever took a trip to visit one of my sister in Breen's. In that brief time, Charlotte managed to evade the other children who were minding her and wander out of the loop. It was 1985 or 86 at that time, I believe. Charlotte was roving blithely about the village by herself when she was discovered by a constable. When she couldn't explain who she was or where she'd come from, not to his liking anyhow, the poor girl was shipped off to a child welfare agency on the mainland. It was two days before I could reach her, and by that time she'd aged 35 years. I think I've seen her picture, I said, a grown woman in little girl's clothes. Miss Peregrine nodded somberly. She never was the same after that, not right in the head. What happened to her? She lives with Miss Nightjar now. Miss Nightjar and Miss Thrush take all the hard cases. But it's not as if they're confined to the island, is it? I asked. Couldn't they still leave now, from 1940? Yes, and begin ageing again as normal. But to what end? To be caught up in a ferocious war? To encounter people who fear and misunderstand them? And there are other dangers as well. It's best to stay here. What are the dangers? Her face clouded as if she regretted having brought it up. Nothing you need to concern yourself with. Not yet, at least. With that, she shooed me outside. I asked her again what she meant by other dangers, but she shut the screen door in my face. Enjoy the morning, she chirped, forcing a smile. Go find Miss Bloom. I'm sure she's dying to see you. And she disappeared into the house. I wandered into the yard, wondering how I was supposed to get the image of that withered apple out of my head. Before long, though, I did. It's not that I forgot. It's just It just stopped bothering me. It was the strangest thing. Resuming my mission to find Emma, I learned from Hugh that she was on a supply run to the village, so I settled under a shade tree to wait. Within five minutes, I was half asleep in the grass, smiling like a dope, wondering serenely what might be on the menu for lunch. It was as if just being here had some kind of narcotic effect on me, like the loop itself was a drug. The mood enhancer and a sedative combined, and if I stayed too long, I'd never want to leave. If that were true, I thought, it would explain a lot of things, like how people could live the same day over and over for decades without losing their minds. And yes, it was beautiful, and life was good, but if every day were exactly alike, and if the kids really couldn't leave, as Miss Peregrine had said, then this place wasn't just a heaven, but a kind of prison too. It was just so hypnotisingly pleasant that it might take a person years to notice, and by then it would be too late, leaving would be too dangerous. So it's not even a decision really, you stay. It's only later, years later, that you begin to wonder what might have happened if you hadn't. I must have dozed off, because around mid-morning I awoke to something nudging my foot, I cracked an eye to discover a little humanoid figure trying to hide inside my shoe, but it had gotten tangled in the laces. It was stiff-limbed and awkward, half a hubcap tall, dressed in army fatigues. I watched it struggle to free itself from a moment and then go rigid, a wind-up toy on its last wind. I untied my shoe to extricate it and then turned it over, looking for the wind-up key, but I couldn't find one. Up close it was strange, crude-looking thing, its head a stump of rounded clay, its face a smeared thumbprint. Bring him here, someone called from across the yard. A boy sat waving at me from a tree stump at the edge of the woods. 
Lacking any pressing engagements, I picked up the clay soldier and walked over. Arranged around the boy was a whole menagerie of wind-up men staggering around like damaged robots. As I drew near, the one in my hands jerked to life again, squirming as if he was trying to get away. I put it with the others and wiped shed clay on my pants. I'm Enoch, the boy said. You must be him. I guess I am, I replied. Sorry if he bothered you, he said, herding the one I'd returned back to the others. They get ideas, see. Ain't properly trained yet, only made him last week. He spoke with a slight cockney accent, cadaverous black circles, ringed his eyes like a raccoon, and his overalls, the same ones he'd worn in pictures I'd seen, were streaked with clay and dirt. Except for his pudgy face, he might have been a chimney sweep out of Oliver Twist. You made these, I asked, impressed. How? The hom homunculi, he replied. Sometimes I put doll, he doll heads on them, but this time I was in a hurry and didn't bother. What's a homunculi? More than one homunculus. Homun homunculus? He said it like it was something any idiot would know. Some people think it's homunculuses, but I think that sounds daft, don't you? Definitely. Clay soldier I'd returned began wandering again with his foot. Enoch nudged it back towards the group. They seemed to be going haywire, colliding with one another like excited atoms. Fight ye Nancy's, he commanded, which is when I realised they weren't simply bumping into one another, but hitting and kicking. The errant clay man wasn't interested in fighting, however. When he began to totter away once more, Enoch snatched him up and snapped off his legs. That's what happens to deserters in my army, he cried, and tossed the crippled figure into the grass, where it writhed grotesquely as the others fell upon it. Do you treat all your toys that way? Why, he said, do you feel sorry for them? I don't know, should I? No, they wouldn't be alive at all if it wasn't for me. I laughed and Enoch scowled at me. What's so funny? You made a joke. You are a bit thick, aren't you, he said. Look here. He grabbed one of the shoulders and stripped off his clothes. Then, with both hands, he cracked it down the middle and removed its sticky chest, a tiny convulsing heart. The soldier instantly went limp. Enoch held the heart between his thumb and forefinger for me to see. It's from a mouse, he explained. That's what I can do. Take the life of one thing and give it to another. Either clay like this or something that used to be alive but ain't anymore. He tucked the stilled heart into his overalls. Soon I figure out how to train them properly. I'll have a whole army like this, only they'll be massive. And he raised an arm up over his head to show me just how massive. What can you do? He said. Me? Nothing really. I mean, nothing special like you. Pity, he replied. Are you going to come live with us anyway? He didn't say it like he wanted me to exactly. He just seemed curious. I don't know, I said. I hadn't thought about it. That was a lie, of course. I had thought about it, but mostly in a daydreaming sort of way. He looked at me suspiciously. But don't you want to? I don't know yet. Narrowing his eyes, he nodded slowly, as if he'd just figured me out. Then he leaned in and said, under his breath, Emma told you about Raid the Village, didn't she? Raid the what? He looked away. Oh, it's nothing, just a game some of us play. I got the distinct feeling I was being set up. She didn't tell me, I said. Enoch scooted toward me on the stump. I bet she didn't, he said. I bet there's a lot of things about this place she wouldn't like you to know. Oh yeah? Why? Because then you'll see it's not as great as everybody wants you to think, and you won't stay. What kinds of things? I asked. Can't tell, he said, flashing me a devilish smile. I could get in big trouble. Whatever I said, you brought it up. I stood to go. Wait, he cried, grabbing my sleeve. Why should I if you're not going to tell me anything? He rubbed his chin judiciously. It's true, I ain't allowed to say anything, but I reckon I couldn't stop you if you was to go upstairs and have a look in the room at the end of the hall. Why, I said. What's in there? My friend Victor, he wants to meet you. Go up and have a chat. Fine, I said, I will. I started toward the house and then heard Enoch whistle. He mimed running a hand along the top of the door. The key, he mouthed. What do I need a key for if someone's in there? He turned away, pretending not to hear. 
I sauntered into the house and up the stairs like I had business there and didn't care who knew it. Reaching the second floor unobserved, I crept to the room at the end of the hall and tried the door. It was locked. I knocked, but there was no answer. Glancing over my shoulder to make sure no one was watching, and I ran my hand along the top of the door frame. Sure enough, I found a key. I unlocked the door and slipped inside. It was like any other bedroom in the house, but there was a dresser, a wardrobe, a vase of flowers on a nightstand. The late morning sun shone through drawn curtains the colour of mustard, throwing such yellow light everywhere that the whole room seemed encased in amber. Only then did I notice a young man lying in the bed, his eyes closed and mouth slightly open, half hidden behind a lace curtain. I froze, afraid I'd wake him. I recognised him from Miss Peregrine's album, though I hadn't seen him at meals or around the house, and we'd never been introduced. In the picture, he'd been asleep in bed, just as he is now. Had he been quarantined, infected with some sleeping sickness? Was Enoch trying to get me sick too? Hello, I whispered. Are you awake? He didn't move. I put a hand on his arm and shook him gently. His head lolled to one side. Then something terrible occurred to me. To test a theory, I held my hand in front of his mouth. I couldn't feel his breath. My finger brushed his lips, which were cold as ice. Shocked, I pulled my hand away. Then I heard footsteps and spun around to see Bromwyn in the doorway. You ain't supposed to be in here, she hissed. He's dead, I said. Bromwyn's eyes went to the boy and her face puckered. That's Victor. Suddenly it came to me where I'd seen his face. He was the boy lifting the boulder in my grandfather's pictures. Victor was Bromwyn's brother. There was no telling how long he might have been dead. As long as the loop kept looping, it could be fifty years and only look like a day. What happened to him? I asked. Maybe I'll wake old Victor up, came a voice from behind us, and you can ask him yourself. It was Enoch. He came in and shut the door. Bromwyn beamed at him through welling tears. Would you wake him? Oh, please, Enoch. I shouldn't, he said. I'm running low on hearts as it is, and it takes a right lot of them to rise up a human being, even for just a minute. Bromwyn crossed to the dead boy and began to smooth his hair with her fingers. Please, she begged. It's been ages since we talked to Victor. Well, I do have some cow hearts pickling in the basement, he said, pretending to consider it. But I hate to use inferior ingredients. Fresh is always better. Bromwyn began to cry in earnest. One of her tears fell onto the boy's jacket. She hurried to wipe it away with her sleeve. Don't get so choked, Enoch said. You know I can't stand it. Anyway, it's cruel waking Victor. He likes it where he is. And where's that, I said. Who knows, but whenever we rouse him for a chat, he seems in a dreadful hurry to get back. What's cruel is you toying with Bronwyn like that and tricking me, I said. And if Victor's dead, why don't you just bury him? Bronwyn flashed me a look of utter derision. Then we'd never get to see him, she said. That stings, mate, said Enoch. I only mentioned coming up here because I wanted you to have all the facts, like, I'm on your side. Yeah? What are the facts then? How did Victor die? Bromwyn looked up. He got killed by an owl. She squealed as Enoch pinched the back of her arm. Hush, he cried. It ain't for you to tell. This is ridiculous, I said. If neither of you will tell me, I'll just go and ask Miss Peregrine. Enoch took a quick stride toward me, eyes wide. Oh no, you, you mustn't do that. Yeah, why mustn't I? The bird don't like us talking about Victor. It's why she wears black all the time, you know. Anyway, she can't find out we've been in here. She'll hang us by our pinky toes. As if on cue, we heard the unmistakable sound of Miss Peregrine limping up the stairs. Bronwyn turned white and dashed past me out the door, but before Enoch could escape, I blocked his path. Out of the way, I hissed. Tell me what happened to Victor. I can't. Then tell me about Raid the Village. I can't tell you that, neither. He tried to shove past me again, but when he realised he couldn't, he gave up. All right, just shut the door and I'll whisper it to you. I closed it just as Miss Peregrine was reaching the landing. We stood with our ears pressed to the door for a moment, listening for a sign that we'd been spotted. The 
headmistress's footsteps came halfway down the hall towards us, then stopped. Another door creaked open and shut. She's gone into her room, Enoch whispered. So, I said, raid the village? Looking like he was sorry he'd brought it up, he mentioned. He motioned me away from the door. I followed, leaning down so he could whisper into my ear. Like I said, it's a game we play. It works just like the name says. You mean you actually raid the village? Smash it up, chase people around, take what we like, burn things down. It's all a good laugh. But that's terrible. We got to practice our skills somehow, don't we? In case we ever need to defend ourselves. Otherwise, we'd get rusty. Plus, there's rules. We ain't allowed to kill anybody, just scare them up a bit, like. And if someone does get hurt, well, their back rights rain the next day, don't remember anything about it. Does Emma play too? Nah, she's like you, says it's evil. Well, it is. He rolled his eyes. You two deserve each other. What's that supposed to mean? He rose up to his full five foot four inch height and poked a finger into my chest. It means you better not get all high and mighty with me, mate, because if we didn't raid the damned village once in a while, most of this lot would have gone off their heads ages ago. He went to the door and put his hand on the knob and then turned back to face me. And if you think we're wicked, wait till you see him. Them who? What the hell is everyone talking about? He held up one finger to shush me, then went out. I was alone again. My eyes were drawn to the body on the bed. What happened to you, Victor? Maybe he'd gone crazy and killed himself. I thought I'd gotten so sick of this cheerful but futureless eternity that he'd guzzled rat poison or taken a dive off a cliff or maybe it was them, those other dangers Miss Peregrine had alluded to. I stepped into the hall and had just started toward the stairs when I heard Miss Peregrine's voice behind a half-closed door. I dove into the nearest room and stayed hidden until she'd limped past me and down the stairs. Then I noticed a pair of boots at the front of a crisply made bed. Emma's boots. I was in her room, her bedroom. Along one wall was a chest of drawers and a mirror on the other, a writing desk with a chair tucked underneath. It was the room of a neat girl with nothing to hide, or so it seemed, until I found a hat box just inside the closet. It was tied up with string and in grease pencil across the front was written, Private Correspondence of Emma Bloom. Do not open. It was like waving red underwear at a bull. I sat down with the box in my lap and untied the string. It was packed with a hundred or more letters, all from my grandfather. My heart picked up speed. This was exactly the kind of gold mine I'd been hoping to find in the old ruined house. Sure, I felt bad about snooping, but if people here insisted on keeping things secret, well, I'd just have to find stuff out for myself. I wanted to read them all, but was afraid someone would walk in on me, so I thumbed through them quickly to get an overview. Many were dated from the early 1940s, during Grandpa Portman's time in the army. A random sampling revealed them to be long and sappy, full of declarations of his love and awkward descriptions of Emma's beauty in my grandfather's then broken English. You are pretty like flower. Have good smell also. May I pick... In one, he'd enclosed a picture of himself posing atop a bomb with a cigarette dangling from his lips. Over time, his letters grew shorter and less frequent. By the 1950s, there was maybe one a year. The last was dated April 1963. Inside the envelope was no letter, just a few pictures. Two were of Emma, snapshots she'd sent in that he'd sent back. The first was from early on, a joke he posed to answer his of her peeling potatoes and pretending to smoke one of Miss Peregrine's pipes. The next one was sadder, and I imagine she'd sent it after my grandfather had failed to write for a while. The last photo, the last thing he'd ever sent her, in fact, showed my grandfather at middle age holding a little girl.
this is why I had to stare at the last picture for a minute before I realised who the little girl was. It was my aunt Susie, maybe four years old then. After that, there were no more letters. I wondered how much longer Emma had continued writing to my grandfather without receiving a reply, and what he'd done with her letters. Thrown them out? Stashed them somewhere? Surely it had to be one of those letters that my father and aunt had found as kids that made them think their father was a liar and a cheat. How wrong they were. I heard a throat clear behind me and turned to see Emma glaring from the doorway. I scrambled to gather the letters, my face flushing, but it was too late. I was caught. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be in here. I'm bloody well aware of that, she said. But by all means, don't let me interrupt your reading. She stamped over to her chest of drawers, yanked me, yanked one out and threw it clattering on the floor. While you're at it, why don't you have a look through my knickers too? I'm really, really sorry, I repeated. I never do things like this. Oh, I shouldn't wonder. Too busy peeping in ladies' windows, I suppose. She towered over me, shaking with anger, while I struggled to fit all the letters back into the box. There's a system, you know, just give them here, you're mucking everything up. She sat down and pushed me aside, emptying the box onto the floor and sorting the letters into piles with the speed of a postal worker. Thinking at best to shut my mouth, I watched meekly while she worked. When she'd calmed a little, she said, So you want to know about Abe and me, is that it? Because you could have just asked. I didn't want to pry. Rather a moot point now, wouldn't you say? I guess. So, what is it you want to know? I thought about it. I wasn't really sure where to start. Just what happened. All right, then. We'll skip all the nice bits and go right to the end. It's simple, really. He left. He said he loved me and promised to come back one day, but never did. But he had to go, didn't he? To fight. Had to. I don't know. He said he wouldn't be able to live with himself if he sat out the wall while his people were being hunted and killed. Said it was his duty. I suppose duty meant more to him than I did. Anyhow, I waited. I waited and worried through that whole bloody war, thinking every letter that came was a death notice. Then when the war was finally over, he said he couldn't possibly come back. Said he'd go stark raving said he'd learned how to defend himself in the army and he damn well didn't need a nanny like the bird to look after him anymore. He was going to America to make a home for us and then he'd send for me. So I waited more. I waited so long that if I'd actually gone to be with him, I would have been 40 years old. By then he'd taken up with some commoner. And that, as they say, was that. I'm sorry, I had no idea. It's an old story. I don't drag it out much anymore. You blame him for being stuck here, I said. She gave me a sharp look. Who says I'm stuck? Then she sighed. No, I don't blame him. Just miss him is all. Still, every day. She finished sorting the letters. There you have it, she said, clapping the lid closed on them. The entire history of my love life in a dusty box in the closet. She drew a deep breath and then shut her eyes and pinched the bridge of her nose. For a moment, I could almost see the old woman behind her smooth features. My grandfather had trampled her poor, pining heart, and the wound was still raw, even these many years later. I thought of putting my arm, to, arm around her, but something stopped me. Here was this beautiful, funny, fascinating girl, who, a miracle of miracles, really seemed to like me. But now I understood that it wasn't me she liked. She was heartbroken for someone else and I was merely a stand-in for my grandfather. That's enough to give anyone pause. I don't care how horny you are. I know guys who are grossed out by the idea of dating a friend's ex. By that standard, dating your grandfather's ex would be practically incest. The next thing I knew, Emma's hand was on my arm, then her head was on my shoulder, and I could feel her chin tracking slowly towards my face. This was a kiss-me body language if there ever was such a thing. In a minute, our faces would be level and I'd have to choose between locking lips or seriously offending her by pulling away. And I'd already offended her once. It's not that I didn't want to. More than anything, I did. But the idea of kissing her two feet from a box of obsessively well-preserved love letters from my grandfather made me feel weird and nervous. Then her cheek was against mine and I knew it was now or never. So I said the first 
mood-killing thing that popped into my head. Is there something going on between you and Enoch? She pulled away instantly, looking at me like I'd suggest we dine on puppies. What? No. What on earth did you get a twisted idea like that? From him, he sounds kind of bitter when he talks about you, and I get the distinct impression he doesn't want me around, like I'm horning in on his game or something. Her eyes kept getting wider. First of all, he doesn't have any game to horn in on. I can assure you of that. He's a jealous fool and a liar. Is he? Is he which? A liar. She narrowed her eyes. Why? What kind of nonsense has he been spouting? Emma, what happened to Victor? She looked shocked. Then shaking her head, she muttered, Damn that selfish boy. There's something no one here is telling me, and I want to know what it is. I can't, she said. That's all I've been hearing. I can't talk about the future. You can't talk about the past. Miss Peregrine has us all tied up in knots. My grandfather's last wish was for me to come here and find out the truth. Doesn't that mean anything? She took my hand and brought it into her lap and looked down at it. She seemed to be searching for the right words. You're right, she said, finally. There is something. Tell me. Not here, she whispered. Tonight. We arranged, we arranged to meet late that night when my dad and Miss Peregrine would be asleep. Emma insisted it was the only way because the walls had ears and it was impossible to slip off together during the day without arousing suspicion. To complete the illusion that we had nothing to hide, we spent the rest of the afternoon hanging out in the yard in full view of everyone, and when the sun began to set, I walked back to the bog, alone. It was another rainy evening in the 21st century, and by the time I reached the pub, I was thankful just to be somewhere dry. I found my dad alone, nursing a beer at a table, so I pulled up a chair and began fabricating stories about my day while toweling off my face with napkins. Something I was beginning to discover about mine. The more I did it, the easier it got. He was hardly ever listening. Huh? That's interesting. And then his gaze would drift off and he'd take another swig of beer. What's up with you, I said. Are you still pissed at me? No, no, nothing like that. He was about to explain but waved it away. Ah, stupid. Dad, come on. It's just... This guy who showed up a couple of days ago, another birder, someone you know? He shook his head. Never seen him before. At first I thought he was just some part-time enthusiast, Yahoo, but he keeps coming back to the same sites, the same nesting grounds, taking notes. He definitely knows what he's doing. Then today I saw him with a banding cage and a pair of predators, so I know he's a pro. Predators? Binoculars, real serious glass. He wadded up his paper placemat and re-smoothed it three times now. Nervous habit. It's just that I thought I had the scoop on this bird population, you know. I really wanted this book to be something special. And then this asshole comes along. Jacob. I mean, this no-good son of a bitch. He laughed. Thank you, son. That'll do. It will be special, I said reassuringly. He shrugged. I don't know. Hope so. But he didn't sound too certain. I knew exactly what was about to happen. It was part of this pathetic cycle my dad was caught in. He'd get really passionate about some project, talk about it non-stop for months, then inevitably some tiny problem would crop up and throw sand in the gears, and instead of dealing with it, he'd let it completely overwhelm him. The next thing you knew, the project would be off, and he'd be on to the next one, and the cycle would start again. He got discouraged too easily. It was the reason why he had a dozen unfinished manuscripts locked in his desk and why the bird's store he tried to open with Aunt Susie never got off the ground and why he had a bachelor's degree in Asian languages but had never been to Asia. He was 46 years old and still trying to find himself, still trying to prove he didn't need my mother's money. What he really needed was a pep talk, and that I didn't feel at all qualified to give, so instead I tried to subtly change the subject. Where's this interloper staying? I thought we had the only rooms in town. I assume he's camping, my dad replied. In this weather? It's kind of a hardcore ornithology geek thing. Roughing it gets you closer to your subjects, both physically and psychologically. Achievement through adversity and all that. I laughed. Then why aren't you out there, I said then immediately wished I hadn't. Same reason my book probably won't happen. There's always someone more dedicated than I am. 
shifted awkwardly in my chair. I didn't mean it like that. What I meant was, shh, my dad stiffened, glancing furtively towards the door. Look quick, but don't make it obvious. He just walked in. I shielded my face with the menu and peeked over the top. A scruffy-looking bearded guy stood in the doorway, stamping water from his boots. He wore a rain hat and dark glasses and what appeared to be several jackets layered on top of one another, which made him look both fat and vaguely transient. I love the homeless Santa Claus thing he's got going on, I whispered. Not an easy look to pull off very next season. He ignored me. The man bellied up to the bar and conversations around him quieted a notch or two. Kev asked why he'd, what he'd like and the man said something and Kev disappeared into the kitchen. He stared straight ahead as he waited and a minute later Kev came back and handed the guy a doggy bag. He took it, dropped some bills on the bar and went to the door. Before leaving he turned to slowly scan the room then after a long moment he left. What do you order? My dad shouted when the door swung shut. Couple of steaks, Kev replied. Said he didn't care how they were cooked, so he got them in ten seconds, a side rare, no complaints. People began to mutter and speculate, the volume of their conversations rising again. Raw steak, I said to my father. You gotta admit, even for an ornithologist, that's a little weird. Maybe he's a raw foodist, Dad replied. Yeah, right, or maybe he got tired of feasting on the blood of lambs. Dad rolled his eyes. The man obviously has a camp stove. He probably just prefers to cook it out in the open. In the rain? And why are you defending him anyway? I thought he was your arch nemesis. I don't expect you to understand, but it would be nice if you didn't make fun of me. And he stood up to go to the bar. A few hours later, my dad stumbled upstairs, reeking of alcohol, and flopped into his bed. He was asleep instantly, ripping out monster snores. I grabbed a coat and set out to meet Emma. No sneaking necessary. The streets were deserted and so quiet you could almost hear the dew fall. Clouds stretched thinly across the sky with just enough moonlight glowing through to light my way. As I crested the ridge, a prickly feeling crept over me and I looked around to see a man watching me from a distant outcropping. He had his hands raised to his face and his elbows splayed out like he was looking through binoculars. The first thing I thought was, damn it, I'm caught, assuming it was one of the sheep farmers out on watch, playing detective. But if so, why wasn't he coming over to confront me? Instead, he just stood and watched, and I watched back. Finally, I figured if I'm caught, I'm caught, because whether I went back now or kept going, one way or another word of my late night excursion would circle back to my dad. So I raised my arm in a one-finger salute and descended into the chilly fog. Coming out of the con, it looked like the clouds had been peeled back and the moon pumped up like a big yellow balloon, so bright I'd almost had to squint. A few minutes later, Emma caught, wading through the bog, apologising and talking a mile a minute. Oh, sorry I'm late. It took ages for everyone to get to bed. Then on my way out, I stumbled over Hugh and Fiona snogging each other's faces off in the garden. But don't worry, they promised not to tell if I didn't. She threw her arms around my neck. I missed you, she said. Sorry about before. I am too, I said, patting her back awkwardly. So let's talk. She pulled away. Not here. There's a better place, a special place. Oh, I don't know. She took my hand. Don't be that way. You'll adore it, I promise. And when we get there, I'll tell you everything. I was pretty certain it was a plot to get me to make out with her. And I had been... And and had I been any older or wiser or one of those guys for whom make-out sessions with hot girls were so frequent as to be of no consequence, I might have had the emotional and hormonal fortitude to demand that we have our talk right then and there. But I was none of those things. Besides, there was the way she beamed at me, smiling with her whole self and how a coy gesture like tucking her hair back could make me want to follow her help her do anything she asked. I was hopelessly outmatched. I'll go, but I'm not going to kiss her, I told myself. I repeated it like a mantra as she led me across the bog. Do not kiss, do not kiss. We headed for town, but veered off towards the rocky beach that looked out onto the lighthouse. Picking our way down the steep path to the sand, 
reaching the water's edge, she told me to wait and ran off to retrieve something. I stood watching the lighthouse beam wheel round and wash over everything. A million seabirds sleeping in the pitted cliffs, giant rocks exposed by the low tide, a rotted skiff drowning in the sand. When Emma came back, I saw that she had changed into her swimsuit and was holding up a pair of snorkel masks. Oh no, I said, no way. You might want to strip to your skivvies, she said, looking doubtfully at my jeans and coat. Your outfit's all wrong for swimming. That's because I'm not going swimming. I agreed to sneak out and meet you in the middle of the night, fine. But just to talk, not to. We will talk, she insisted. Underwater, in my boxes. She kicked sand at me and started to walk away, but then turned and came back. I'm not going to attack you if that's what you're in a knit about. Don't flatter yourself. I'm not. Then quit mucking about. Take off those silly trousers. And then she did attack me, wrestling me to the ground and struggling to remove my belt with one hand while rubbing sand in my face with the other. Blah! I cried, spitting out sand. Dirty fighter, dirty fighter. I had no choice but to return the favour with a fistful of my own. And pretty soon things devolved into a no-holds-barred sand fight. When it was over, we were both laughing and trying in vain to brush it all out of our hair. Well, now you need a bath, so you might as well get in the damned water. Okay, fine. The water was shockingly cold at first. Not a great situation vis-a-vis -vis wearing only boxer shorts, but I got used to the temperature pretty quickly. We waded out past the rocks where, lashed to a depth marker, was a canoe. We clambered onto it and Emma handed me an oar and we both started paddling, heading towards the lighthouse. The night was warm, the sea was calm, and for a few minutes I lost, my, lost myself in the pleasant rhythm of oars slapping water. About a hundred yards from the lighthouse, Emma stopped paddling and stepped overboard. To my amazement, she didn't slip under the waves, but stood submerged only to her knees. Are you on a sandbar or something? Nope. She reached into the canoe, pulled out a little anchor and dropped it. It fell about three feet before stopping with a metal clang. A moment later, the lighthouse beam swept past and I saw the hull of a ship stretching beneath us on all sides. A shipwreck. Come on, she said, we're nearly there. And bring your mask. She started walking around the wrecked boat's hull. I stepped out gingerly and followed. To anyone watching from shore, it would have looked like we were walking on water. How big is this thing, anyway? Massive. It's an allied allied warship hit a friendly mine and sank right here she stopped look away from the lighthouse for a minute she said let your eyes get used to the dark so we stood facing the shore and waited a small wave slapped at our thighs all right now follow me and take a giant breath she walked over to a dark hole in the ship's hull a door from the look of it then sat down on the edge and plunged in this is insane, I thought, and then I strapped on the mask she'd given me and plunged in after her. I peered into the enveloping blackness between my feet to see Emma pulling herself further down by the rungs of a ladder. I grabbed the top of it and followed, descending hand over hand until it stopped at the metal floor where she was waiting. We seemed to be in some sort of cargo hold, though it was too dark to tell much more than that. I tapped her elbow and pointed to my mouth. I need to breathe. She patted my arm condescendingly and reached for a length of plastic tubing that hung nearby. It was connected to a pipe that ran up the ladder to the surface. She put the tube in her mouth and blew, her cheeks puffing out with the effort, then took a breath from it and passed it to me. I sucked in a welcome lung full of air. We were twenty feet underwater, inside an old shipwreck, and we were breathing. Emma pointed at a doorway in front of us, little more than a black hole in the murk. I shook my head. Don't want to, but she took my hand as though I were a frightened toddler and led me toward it, bringing the, bringing the tube along. We drifted through the doorway into total darkness. For a while, we just hung there, passing the breathing tube between us. There was no sound but our breaths bubbling up and obscure thuds from deep inside the ship pieces of the broken hull knocking in the current. If I'd shut my eyes, it wouldn't have been any darker. We were like astronauts floating in a starless universe. But then a baffling and magnificent thing happened. 
One by one, the stars came out, here and there a green flash in the dark. I thought I was hallucinating, but then more lit up and still more until the whole constellation surged around us, like a million green twinkling stars lighting our bodies, reflecting in our masks. Emma held out her hand and flicked her wrist, but rather than producing a ball of fire, her hand glowed a scintillating blue. The green stars collaced around it, flashing and whirling, echoing her movements like a school of fish, which I realised is just what they were. Mesmerised, I lost all track of time. We stayed there for what seemed like hours, though it was probably only a few minutes. Then I felt Emma nudge me, and we retreat retreated through the doorway and up the ladder, and when we broke the surface again, the first thing I saw was the great bold stripe of the Milky Way painted across the heavens. And it occurred to me that together the fish and the stars formed a complete system, coincident parts of some ancient, mysterious whole. We pulled ourselves onto the hull and took off our masks. For a while we just sat like that, half submerged, thighs touching, speechless. What were those? I said finally. We call them flashlight fish. I've never seen one before. Most people never do, she said. They hide. They're beautiful. Yes. And peculiar. Emma smiled. They are that too. And then her hand crept onto my knee and I let it stay there because it felt warm and good in the cool water. I listened for the voice in my head telling me not to kiss her, but it had gone silent. <clears throat> and then we were kissing, the profoundness of our lips touching and our tongues pressing, and my hand cupping her perfect white cheek barred any thoughts of right or wrong, or any memory of why I had followed her there in the first place. We were kissing and kissing, and suddenly it was over. As she pulled away, I followed her face with mine. She put a hand on my chest, at once gentle and firm. I need to breathe, dummy. I laughed. Okay. She took my hands and looked at me, and I looked back. It was almost more intense than kissing, the just looking. And then she said, you should stay. Stay, I repeated. Here with us, the reality of her words filtered through, and the tingly magic of what had just happened between us numbed out. I want to, but I don't think I can. Why not? I considered the idea, the sun, the feast, the friends, and the sameness, the perfect, identical days. You can get sick of anything if you have too much of it, like all the petty luxuries my mother bought and quickly grew bored with. But Emma, there was Emma. Maybe it wasn't so strange what we could have. Maybe I could stay for a while and love her and then go home. But no, by the time I wanted to leave, it'd be too late. She was a siren. I had to be strong. It's him you want, not me. I can't be him for you. She looked away, stung. This isn't why you should stay. You belong here, Jacob. I don't. I'm not like you. Yes, you are, she insisted. I'm not. I'm common, just like my grandfather. Emma shook her head. Is that really what you think? If I could do something spectacular like you, don't you think I would have noticed by now? I'm not meant to tell you this, she said, but common people can't pass through time loops. I considered this for a moment, but couldn't make sense of it. There's nothing peculiar about me. I'm, I'm the most average person you'll ever meet. I doubt that very much, she replied. Abe had a rare and peculiar talent, something almost no one else could do. And then she met my eyes and said, he could see the monsters.